Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when standing before Pilate, kept silent at all the unjust accusations and slanders of the Jews, and as a gentle lamb that did not open its mouth, did not con contradict them when they brought forward their charges against you. Give me grace never to be disturbed by the false accusations of others, but may I overcome every injury by silence and meekness. Give me the grace of perfect humility, so that I may never desire praise nor refuse any measure of contempt. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, you, Lamb without spot, against whom the pious Pharisees and scribes raged with obstinate hatred. For although Pilate testified that he found no cause of death in you, yet they would not be satisfied with anything except your death. Grant me grace to imitate your innocence and patience, that I may both lead a godly life, and for so doing, if I am spoken of evilly, that I may remain at rest in you, giving way to no indignation, but giving thanks to you in all adversity. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who were led in great, the greatest of indignity, in the manner of a wicked criminal through the middle of the city, from one judgment seat to another, and from Pilate to Herod and back again amidst the noise and shouts of the people. Give me grace never to be overcome by the injuries of my enemies, nor to be exasperated by slander. May I never feel any false shame at being despised, but may I receive everything in meekness and endure all things in silence for your honour, that, by the assistance of your grace, I may in patience possess my soul. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when Herod asked you many vain and foolish questions, and when you were falsely wounded in different ways by priest and scribe, humbly kept a meet and becoming silence. Give me grace to restrain my tongue in a manner well-pleasing to you. Do not permit me to utter hurtful words. Do not permit me to be taken up with fruitless stories but give me grace to say what is right, profitable and honest, according to your will. May I abhor the, the sin of evil speaking, and be always glad to think and speak well of any man. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who condemned by your silence the foolish curiosity of Herod, and who would not gratify his curious eyes by the performance of any miracle, because he did not have his own salvation at heart, and did there, there in this way teach us to avoid all ostentation before the great ones of this world. Pour into my heart a spirit of deep humility, mortify and quench within me any desire for vain glory. Grant that I may never do anything in order to gain praise of man, but may always act with a single eye, upon the glory of your most holy name, and may come before you day by day in a true spirit of humility and meekness. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who didn't refuse to be set to nothing by Herod and his men of war, nor to be clothed in a white garment and to be mocked and laughed at as though a fool and a madman. Give me grace, O Lord, to choose rather to be an outcast with you than to be glorious in the world. May I think it better and more honourable to suffer reproach for your name than to prosper in the vain honours of the world. Give me grace that, truly acknowledging my own sins and my own unworthiness, I may be as nothing in my own sight, but may always despise and accuse myself and daily lament over my own weakness and wretchedness. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was sent back with shame, clothed in a fool's garment from Herod the Pilate, and in all things obeyed your enemies going backwards and forwards according to their pleasure. 
Grant that I may not shrink from being despised, nor refuse obedience even to those who wish nothing but bad for me. Give me grace to have no feeling for the things of this world, but to think of and care for and love you alone. May you alone be my honour, my delight, my love, my glory, and my joy. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths will sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapters 23 and 24. Now there was a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their plan and action. He was from the Judean town of Arimathea, and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock, where no one had yet been buried. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they returned and prepared aromatic spices and perfumes. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. And on the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the aromatic spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. When they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood beside them in dazzling attire. The women were terribly frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has been raised. Remember how he told you, when he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and then on the third day rise again. Then the women remembered his words, and when they returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed like pure nonsense to them, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw only strips of linen cloth, and then he returned home, wondering what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Previously, we were told that the friends of Jesus were standing at a distance from the crucifixion. They, almost certainly being poor country people, would not have had the wherewithal to arrange the burial of Jesus, nor even the status to approach Pilate for permission to take the body. Just when all must have seemed completely helpless, God produced a friend from within the inner circle, probably the one member of the Sanhedrin, who had not been instrumental in securing the crucifixion. Not just a friend either, but probably the one person who had both the availability of a tomb and access to Pilate. This is a good example to us, for it shows God at work even when it appears that everything is lost. For in truth, we are never lost. We are just looking in the wrong direction, for God never leaves us. It's worth noting two things. First of all, the women went at first light, as soon as it was dawn, and they could see where it was going. They did not wait until after they had eaten, or go later in the morning. They went at the very first possible opportunity. Secondly, we are given the names of three of the women, but we are also told that they took others with them as well. When two or three are driven and excited to do something, they can infect others with their enthusiasm, as happened here. As we look back on the events of that first Easter, we should give some thought to the true heroes of that morning, that small band of women who went to the tomb to continue their adoration of Jesus. Would we have waited merely for the first rays of daylight, or would we have had breakfast first and gone later in the day? The first thought that these words of the angel messenger and the scene in which we find them suggests the, the dead are the living language 
which is more accustomed and adapted to express the appearances than the reality of things, leads us astray when we very much use the phrase the dead, as if expressed by the continuance of the condition into which men pass in the act of dissolution. The dead are the living who have died. Whilst they were dying, they lived, and after they were dead, they lived more fully. All live unto God. How solemnly sometimes that thought comes up before us. That all those past generations who have stormed one way or the other across the earth and have then fallen into still forgetfulness, live on yet. Somewhere at this very instant, they now verily are. Death is not a state, it is an act. It is not a condition, but a transition, a passing through a doorway. This text, indeed the whole incident, may set before us other considerations. Since they have died, they live a life better than ours. In what particulars is their life now higher than ours? Firstly, they have a close fellowship with Christ. Secondly, they are separated from the present body of weakness, of dishonour, sin and corruption. Thirdly, they are withdrawn from all the tr trouble and toil and cares of the present life. And finally, they have death behind them, and not having that awful figure standing on the horizon, waiting for them to come up with it. The better life which the dead are now living leads on to a still fuller life when they get back their glorified bodies. Body, soul and spirit, the old combination which was on earth, is to be the perfect humanity of heaven. The spirits that are perfected, that are living in blessedness, that are dwelling in God, that are sleeping in Christ, at this moment are waiting, stretching out hands of faith and hope or that they could not be unclothed, but clothed upon which their house is from heaven, that mortality may be swallowed up of life. Observe how Christ's resurrection harmonises with the history of his birth. David had foretold that his soul should not be left in hell, that is the unseen state. Neither should the Holy One of God see corruption. In the angel's announcement at his birth, his incorruptible and immortal nature is suggested. Death might overpower, but it could not keep possession. It had no dominion over him. He was, in the words of the text, the living among the dead. The grave could not detain him who had life in himself. He rose as a man awakes in the morning when sleep flies from him as a thing of course. Jesus Christ showed himself to his disciples in his exalted state, that they might be witnesses to the people, witnesses of those separate truths which man's reason cannot combine, that he had a real human body, that it was a partaker in the properties of his soul, and that it was inhabited by the eternal word. They touched him, they saw him come and go when doors were shut, they felt what they could not see, but could witness even unto death that he was their Lord and their God. A triple evidence. First of all, his atonement. Next, of their own resurrection into glory and finally of his divine power to conduct them safely to it. Thus revealed as perfect God and perfect man in the fullness of his sovereignty and the immortality of his holiness, he ascended up on high to take possession of his kingdom. As Adam is the author of death to the whole human race, so is Christ the origin of immortality. Adam spreads poison, Christ diffuses the antidote, life eternal. Christ communicates us to us one by one by means of that holy and incorruptible nature which he assumed for our redemption. 
how we know not, though by an unseen, still by a real communication of himself. How wonderful a work of grace. Strange it was that Adam should be our death, but stranger still and very gracious that Lord, our Lord God himself should be our life by means of that human tabernacle which he took upon himself. We can barely imagine that had the cross and the sepulchre been the end of the course for Jesus, his followers would have held up many months. That such men should knit up again their raveled and scattered expectations. That these disciples, being what we know them to have been, should have recovered heart, as the narrative tells us, and as the world's history shows us that they did. It is simply inconceivable, supposing that nothing more happened after the deposition in the tomb. We cannot imagine them, crushed, disappointed, deceived men, standing up before the victorious enemies of their disgraced master and proclaiming him a prince and a saviour. There is only way, one way of accounting for this, and that is that the resurrection really took place as we are told it did. There have been many strange days in this world's history, but there was never a day so strange as this one of the resurrection, because never one that resembled it in its that which happened. As the loss had been, so was the gain. As the sorrow, so the joy. A new order of things was begun, a new life was sprung up. The harvest, which seemed to have been all of a heap in the day of desperate sorrow, is become seed for another and endless sowing. With the joy comes respectability. They could not be but speak of those things that they had seen and heard. This testimony of witness fact became a necessity of their lives, and they went about invested with its responsibility. And with joy at that responsibility came also strength. In proportion to the greatness of the event, in proportion to the vastness of the change, in proportion to the working of the Spirit, their evidence given with power, so that it bore down all opposition. Between Peter disclaiming Jesus, Peter weeping bitterly for his lack of faith, Peter returning from the sepulchre, wondering in himself what this all meant, and Peter standing before the council and proclaiming that there is no other name given under heaven amongst men, whereby we must be saved. There needs no link supply. If this joy gave responsibility and strength followed. Otherwise, how can the weakness and the power belong to the same person? How the same man is to utter in a few short days some of the weakest and basest and some of the boldest and grandest words in this world's history. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, who is the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech you, to hear the devout prayers of your Church. Grant that those things which we ask faithfully, we may obtain effectually. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us from all evil, bringing us to everlasting life. Amen.